right. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Well, hey, Lake Point family, uh, if you guys got your Bibles, head over to Acts chapter 5. Acts 5 is where we're going to be today. And uh, I'll be honest, um, I got this deep belief that something supernaturally bad happens when you start to treat holy things as if they're common. So, hey, guys, we would be insane if we didn't celebrate something. So in case you missed this because of severe thunderstorm weekend, last weekend was baptism weekend. And uh, I, I, I'm probably going to have tears as I talk about this. But can we celebrate the fact, because, and here's why we need to celebrate it, because people who took this step for the first time in their life, they're sitting all around you at all of our campuses. But right now, that's it, that's it, okay? But would you guys, listen, can you help me celebrate in one weekend at Lake Point Church, 739 people, come on, man, taking the step of obedience to follow Jesus in baptism. Dude, I just want to, listen, I've never seen anything like that. I'm not, like, that's like, we're preaching Acts, that's Acts level stuff. And uh, dude, I just want to, um, you, you guys, these two people, you don't know I'm doing this, but I want to honor you. I want to tell two stories to give examples. So there was a young man named Grayson who was watching church online, sitting alone in his dorm room on a college campus. He hears a sermon about walking in the fear of the Lord, comes under conviction, gets in his car and drives from Denton to our North Dallas campus, wait, 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 walks into our Lake Point in Espanol campus, a little white college student, a little white college student, like no habla, you know, yo necesito baptizo, or whatever, I don't know how to say it. And he literally, he gets baptized on the spot at our North Dallas campus. Grayson, we celebrate you, man. And then let, let me do one more. Um, this, this may have been my favorite one. I wanna shout out, um, her name was Priscilla. Priscilla was three hours away from her, the closest Lake Point campus, um, alone, at home, church online, on the laptop, same thing, comes under conviction that she needs to follow the Lordship of Jesus in baptism, gets in her car, drives three hours to the closest Lake Point campus. Priscilla, we honor and we celebrate your, man, that step of obedience. Amen, amen, amen. Woo, hey guys, so man, I just want you to know that we're not just changing lives, we're changing legacies, it's not just mothers and fathers, we're changing families and family trees, come on somebody. So man, we just, such, a, such an honor. Now, um, my heart is very full, and so I want to go ahead and get into the passage today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 5. We are right now preaching verse by verse through the book of Acts, and I don't know if you're liking it, but I am loving it. And the reason I'm doing it is because we believe at Lake Point that it takes, watch this, I want to say this over and over, it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And that actually, if we just pick and choose which parts we want, we become like, we become like Christians who didn't do leg day. And so it's a, the foundation's not there. And so, uh, man, here's why we're preaching through Acts. I'm just going to be super honest with you. Here's why I want to do this. It's going to take us like two years off and on. I wanted to do this because the book of Acts is a story about a church where two things were happening. Tons of people were getting saved. And then there was a, a supernatural outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, hey, Lake Point Church, I don't know if your eyes are open. You are in a church where tons of people are getting saved. And there is a supernatural outpouring of the Spirit. And so, what? listen, our job, whenever that happens, is to take the Word of God and go, hey, Will you be a roadmap for us? What does it look like to be faithful in this moment? And so we're just going right through it and find ourselves in Acts 5 today. Now, heads up, because this is a different type of a sermon. Jesus, there are really, you can take Jesus' ministry, and Jesus preached basically two types of sermons. Some sermons, and everybody loves these sermons, <laughs> some sermons were what I would call come and live sermons. Uh, there were at times when Jesus said things like, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Uh, you know, come to me. I, I, I have come to him. I have life and life abundant. Uh, sermons about grace, forgiveness. Let me help you with your anxiety. Let me help you with your marriage. Those are come and live sermons. But then there were other times when Jesus would turn to the crowds that accumulated because of his come and live sermons, and he would preach a go and die sermon. And he would say something like, Anyone who comes after me must forsake his life, must take up his cross and come follow me. Um, what you're getting ready to hear from Acts chapter 5, this is a, is a go and die sermon. 
uh, we're going to talk about three things. Blessings, beatings, and boldness. Does that sound okay? Can we do that? We're going to talk about blessings, beatings, and boldness. So if you got your Bibles, here we go. Let's get into Acts chapter 5. It says this. I'm going to point a few things out. Number one, the apostles, it says, performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. I'm going to point a few things out. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. So I I need you to bookmark that. So nobody wanted to join them because there was a stigma. Hey, those are the weird people. Those are the freaks. Those are the outcasts. You don't want to be all those, those yucky Christians. So people didn't want to join them. But watch this. Even though they were highly regarded among the people. So at the same time, they saw there was blessing on these people's lives, but then they were ostracized and cut off. I'll talk about that in a second, verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord. That sounds familiar. And were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and they laid, their, laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. There was so much miraculous activity in this church that people literally just start hoping Peter's shadow would touch their body. And sometimes at that time, people were healed because of a unique apostolic power on Peter. Verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, bookmark that, and all of them were healed. Now, I just want to shoot you really straight. This is what I call a grip it and rip it sermon. What we just saw is that there are four things that happen in any spirit-filled church, and I want to point this out. Four things that happen in a move of the spirit, number one, we're going to go really fast, is number one, people get loved. What you're seeing right here is that the church took the people the world had cast out and the church took them in. So what you're seeing is the women, the sick, the disabled, the impure, the outcast, the sinful, everybody else, everybody that people pushed out, the church hugged in. And hey, Lake Point, I just need to remind us, When we come in this place and we gather for worship and we sing the songs and we pray the prayers and we get in the huddles, this is not a display case for awesome people. This is an emergency room for people that the enemy has beat up and injured and hurt when we come up in here. That's what this is. So this is who we are. This is a place where people get loved. You know, about about once a year, um, I'll get a letter and it always sounds the same. About once a year and it sounds like this. Somebody will say something like, Pastor. This is what the email sounds like. Pastor. I was very, all caps, very concerned about what I saw on Sunday morning. It's usually got like Southern Baptist homeschool family vibes. And the reason I I can say that, because I am a Southern Baptist homeschool family. I can say that, okay. And they say, man, pastor, I approached, as I approached the house of God with my family this morning, I was aghast and taken aback by what I saw. Standing outside, and then they'll use a word like this, outside the vestibule, they'll say like that, you know was a sight not to be tolerated. (laughs) An unsanitary looking man laden with tattoos whose clothes were unbecoming the reverence of the house of worship. I think he had a Coors logo on his hat, you know. (laughs) Was standing outside the door. He may even have had an ankle monitor on and he smelled like a cigarette. This is what it'll sound like. Now, usually I'll respond, I'll be like, oh, what campus were you at? They'll respond, I'll be like, oh, that's Sean. He works as a parking lot greeter. I know Sean, you know? And then if, it's, if they say a different campus, I'll be like, oh, that dude probably got saved in our prison ministry and he's a faster growing disciple than you. That's what you need to know about that guy. So like, I just wanna like, hey, Lake Point family, can I just remind us, the church is a place where people from any background, they come and get loved. Any background, they come and get loved. So like for some of you, like, man, you just need to be reminded of what this place is. If you're walking in and you're like, man, let me just ask, is this place a little too gritty for you? A little too grimy, too many sinners, not buttoned up up enough for you? Welcome to the fellowship of Jesus Christ, friend of sinners. Welcome to the fellowship of Jesus Christ, friend of sinners. So number one, people get loved. Number two, I gotta go faster, people get saved. It says that many men and women came to the Lord. So non-Christian people were becoming Christian people and watch this, it was happening at a time when becoming a Christian meant two things, opposition and ostracization. Now that matters because we live in a cultural moment where there is more opposition and more ostracization towards faithful, Bible-believing, Jesus-preaching, loving people 
than at any time in our nation's history. Now, I do not accord it, and I'm gonna, you're going to see this verse later. I don't want you to be surprised by this. In fact, that's the whole point of this sermon. So let me really quick, you, you've seen this before, but it's important to me. I need you to understand this where you're living right now. If you've been around the block for a, a few decades, you're noticing a rapid cultural shift in cultural attitudes towards Christianity. Now, a dude named Aaron Wren, a guy that's smarter than me, got more degrees in Fahrenheit, a guy, guy named Aaron Wren, he wrote an article um, uh, 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 with, uh, uh, walking through a three-phase taxonomy of the relationship between our culture and the church in the last 30 to 40 years. Now, I just wanna, I, you need to sketch this, and this is gonna set the tone for like the rest of the book of Acts. Here's why I'm doing this, okay? Wren said pre-1994 is what we could call positive world. This is when, in general, cultural forces were positive towards Christians and churches in our nation. So this was a time where it was like, dude, churches are good, pastors are the good guys, we love the Bible, even if like we're not all the way there and obedient, these were seen as generally positive good things. Now watch this. Because they were viewed as good things, what you ended up with was a lot of what we now call cultural Christianity. So these are people who they were not in Christ, but they did still go to church. So people who are in church, but they're not in Christ. And because they were in church, but they weren't in Christ, they would go to church for their whole lives and they would still end up in hell. So, so this is what we call cultural Christianity. And that used to be a huge phenomenon, still is in some geographic regions, but this was a phenomenon largely uh, relegated to positive world. Now, Wren, for reasons I don't have time to get into, says that around 1994, we shifted into what's called neutral world. As two things, as higher education and journalism rapidly secularized, what you add is it went from Christianity being seen as a positive, it went to like, hey, it's kind of neutral. This was the era of, I call it like Larry King Live Christianity. And who, who knows what, who remembers Larry King Live, okay? If you don't, God bless your metabolism, your flexibility, your hairline, all this stuff, you know. Uh, this, this, but this was a time when it was like, hey, you would see largely on TV, it was like, hey, a Christian who is thoughtful, loving, mature, sitting down with somebody who wasn't a Christian and having a respectful conversation. And kind of the tone was, we can disagree without disrespect. We can disagree without disrespect. This was neutral world. Now, again, for reasons I don't have time to get into, but in 2014, Ren says we really shifted into what's called negative world. Negative world. Now, this is you now live in a day where in general, the, especially the elite levels of society, the cultural forces are against Christianity, Christians, Bible-believing people. So for instance, this is an era in which people don't just view Christianity as wrong, they view it as, uh, they don't just view it as wrong, they view it as evil. That's important because if you view something as simply wrong, you can ignore it, but, but if you view it as evil, you start to feel a moral obligation to oppose it. This is what's happening largely in our culture right now. So because of that, it's kind of this, this mode of like, hey, Christianity isn't just wrong, it's immoral, and if you don't fly our flag, post our hashtag, march in our parade, support our riot, bow down to our idol, we'll fire you, deplatform you, cancel you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is what we now call negative world uh, Christianity, or negative world in our culture. It's, here's the motto. We're tolerant of anything but Christianity, affirming of anything but the Bible, and inclusive of anything but Christians. So increasingly, this is kind of what we see. Like, I'll just be really honest. And, and listen, this may be awkward for you. I simply refuse not to acknowledge things that are true. I, 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 I simply refuse not to acknowledge things that are obviously true, even if they're awkward. So like, for instance, if you walk into an HR department and you walk in right now in like a Fortune 500 company, you're like, hey, I identify as a cat and I worship healing crystals and my pronouns are zizem zur. They're gonna be like, oh, bro, We'll make a, a holiday for you. That's great, okay? Now, if you walk in to that same HR department and you go, hey, I'm Bill, I'm, 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 I'm a new employee here. I'm a Christian, I go to church, I believe the whole Bible, I think marriage is for a man and a woman, I think heaven and hell are real, I think Jesus is the only way to God, and I like to play with my kids and worship Jesus, they're gonna be like, get away, you bigoted freak, Right, And then you're going to be like, man, thank you for your open-minded tolerance. That was amazing. You know, this is amazing. Now, this is what we call, this is negative world. You're in negative world right now. Now, here's my point in pointing this out. In the book of Acts, Acts 5, you're going to notice some beatings happen to Christians. Because of those beatings, there's a whole group of people that are like, huh, there seems to be a blessing on those people's lives. We just don't want to go over there and have anything to do with them. 
Now let me ask you class, and I want you to answer out loud. In the book of Acts, are we dealing with positive, neutral, or negative world? What's the answer? Negative. Negative world. Watch this. The Bible is not an old book, it's a timeless book, so it does not just tell us what happened, it tells us what always happens. The book of Acts, what you're seeing right here, the book of Acts, it's a field guide for what the church should do when it encounters negative world. Now, it, what you're seeing is when the Spirit of God moves, and by the way, hey, Lake Point Church, we have hope because the Spirit of God does movements in negative world. The, the Spirit of God moves. The Spirit of God, in fact, can turn a world upside down is what we see. Now, what you're gonna see here is, man, if you're here and you're like, dude, I've been kind of dipping my toe in this thing. I'm gonna see about this. I don't know if I wanna go all in for Team Jesus, but these people are interesting. I just wanna implore you, start waving the Team Jesus flag. Like, dude, give your life to Jesus, give your reputation to Jesus, give your sin to Jesus, give your future to Jesus, give everything to Jesus. Don't let fear of ostracization from the world keep you from the anointing, blessing, and salvation of God. So you're, you're gonna see this, is that, so, so lost people get saved. We gotta move a little quicker, <laughs> y'all are fun. Number three is people get healed. Let's talk about healing. People get healed in a move of the spirit. People get healed. So you see it, people brought the sick and they were healed. Now, I just gotta say this, I'm not a faith healer, but I am a Bible believer. And what the Bible says is that Jesus sometimes supernaturally heals people. And, and I just wanna say this, if you're scared of that, or if you automatically have a negativity and a skepticism anytime somebody talks about healing, I gently wanna say to you, you may be guilty of quenching the Holy Spirit and you need to repent and believe the Bible. Because what the Bible says is that Jesus sometimes supernaturally heals people. Here's my quick theology of this. Jesus will heal every Christian. Every single Christian, Jesus will heal in one of three ways. Immediately through miracle, gradually through medicine, or eventually in glory. What the church wants to do when a church is full of the spirit, what the church wants to do is we wanna go, hey, I'm praying for number one. Jesus, do it. So like, I just wanna keep laying this down. Hey, Lake Point Church, what the Bible says, it says, his house shall be called a house of prayer. So I, can I just say this? Hey, Lake Point, I want to make Lake Point Church a place where it's hard to walk in the doors and not get prayer for a need. Right, how about that? It's hard to walk in the doors of Lake Point Church, any campus, and not get prayer for a need. So I just want to say this. If you're in a life group, if you're in a lobby and somebody mentions to you an illness, an injury, something they got going on in their lives, like, don't wait. Pray for them now. Don't wait. Now, let them mention it to you. Don't just start grabbing people. That's weird. But if they mention it, let's make it a, hey, let's make it a house of prayer. So that's number three. People get healed. Number four, and then, you know, maybe the one that makes most people uncomfortable, but it's in the Bible, people get delivered. People get delivered. It's, I'm just going to read it to you. It says, those tormented by impure spirits were set free. So I just need to say it because the Bible says it. There are impure spirits that the Bible calls demons. Our culture does not believe it, but the Bible does declare it. What the Bible says is that there was a war in heaven, and Satan and his angels, they did not want to give God glory, they wanted God's glory. They did not want to worship the living God, they wanted to be worshipped by the living God, and so they waged a war against God, and in one second that war was over, because Satan and all of his angels were cast down from heaven, and watch this, if you're wondering, man, why is the world so jacked up? Part of the answer of that, to that is because now the war that was, heaven, it was in heaven is now on earth. And we live in a world with a real enemy, a real enemy, real spiritual evil, who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and there are real evil and impure spirits that the Bible calls demons. It's just, it's right there in the Bible. Now, let me just make a quick application, because we got a lot of like my generation and down, and this is like a thing in my generation and down, so let me just lay down something that you need to understand. What this means is that not all spirituality is safe, good, or godly. Not all spirituality is safe, good, or godly. Some people are like, well, bro, I'm a spiritual person. Satan would love for you just to be a spiritual person. Here's why Satan would love for you to be a spiritual person. Because the Bible says that God is a holy spirit, but that there are also unholy spirits the Bible calls demons. And if you're open to every spirit, then you're opening doors to unholy spirits that are impure, unsafe, dangerous, and can come in your life to steal, kill, and destroy. So, like, dude, if people ask me, you know, I get, I get this in the lobby. Hey, you know, Pastor Josh, 
things like, like fortune telling or tarot cards and Ouija boards and healing crystals, is that stuff real? Yes, it is absolutely real. It's really demonic. It's really demonic. But at the name of Jesus, the darkness has to flee. At the name of Jesus, the darkness has to flee. Okay. Now, okay, so let's look at this. So four things are happening. People are getting loved, people are getting saved, people are getting healed, people are getting delivered. Yay, like everybody, we're, everybody like that's good, right? That's a good thing. We want that. Now here's my question. Who in the world would oppose that? Demonic religious people. Look at this. Here, here's what we got right here. But it says in the next verse, the high priest rose up. Here come the pro-demon and pro-sickness people is what you got. The high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy. This is a side note. I don't have time to preach this message. Filled with jealousy. There is nothing more dangerous than bitter, jealous religious people. There is nothing more dangerous. You see this? So here's what happens. This high priest dude, tall chair, funny hat, all the things. He's worked his, think about this. He worked his whole life to get where he was in the religious pecking order. So like from birth, dude, he probably did Nazaritic vow, didn't, you know, did, didn't clip the hair, didn't have any wine, all the stuff. His, like didn't drink, smoke, cuss, chew, hang out with those who do his entire life. Went to seminary, memorized the Bible, all the stuff, works really hard. Again, wears all the weird stuff, works his whole life to get there. And then he's in Jerusalem and nobody wants to listen to him. They want to listen to the stupid fisherman, Peter. And it ticks him off. And be, watch this. He said he was zealous for righteousness. Actually, he was just filled with jealousy. Actually, he was filled with jealousy. That's what it says right here. So he's filled with jealousy. Then they arrested the apostles and they put them in public prison. Now, I'm gonna short circuit this. Uh, Here's what we're gonna talk about, beatings. So they put him in prison. I I don't have time to read it. Uh, God does this awesome thing. He sends like a ninja angel. He's like, get in there, ninja angel. I've been waiting. We've been waiting for you to have your turn. Here you go. And the ninja angel comes at night and he gets Peter and the apostles out of the public prison. And then, he, and then he tells them, okay, I got you out of prison. Now, go back exactly to where you were and do exactly the thing that got you arrested in the first place. He's like, okay, you know, you stuck your hand in the toaster, go do it again, you know, is what he's saying. In verse 26, it says this, then the captain with the officers went and brought them. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like this, but not by force. For they were, think think about this, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Now, really quick, I just want to point this out. These are my kind of Christians. Because here's what you got here. These were, now think about this. So all these people who are listening to Peter preach about Jesus. They're talking about Jesus. They're worshiping Jesus. They're interested in Jesus. They're hearing the Bible preached. But these dudes were afraid that if they arrested Peter, that that same group was going to rough them up. So, So here's what I like. (laughs) <laughs> these were the Christians who, they were all in on Jesus. They just hadn't gotten to that Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies type thing yet. <laughs> so th- these are the kind of people who were like, if you arrest our preacher, we will bury you. <laughs> so it was like a little bit of holy, a little bit of hood, you know. They, 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 you know. they attended our Forney and Mesquite campuses is what they did right there. I love y'all. I love y'all. Those are my, fa- y'all are my favorite ones. Y'all are my favorite ones. And then they go, man, these, so this crowd, they were like afraid if we arrest their preacher, they may stone us and the rock kind, not the Colorado kind. So this is what they're seeing. They're like, dude, what's going to happen? Yeah, that went way, it, went, it was too fast. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. They got that joke at East Dallas. I know they got that. Let me say that now. Verse 27, <laughs> I need to move on. Let's keep going. And when they had brought them, they sent them before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charged you. Did you not hear the sternly worded memo that we sent? You know, I love this so much. We strictly charged you not to teach, I love this so much, in this name. They would not say the name of Jesus out loud. The demonic religious mob would not say the name of Jesus out loud. Why? Because there is power in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. His is the name that is above every name. And can I just point this out? Hey, Lake Point Church. Uh, doing the stuff that the apostles did does not get you in trouble. If you heal people without talking about Jesus, everybody's like, great, awesome, good job. If you love people without talking about Jesus, great, love you, good job. But if you heal people and love people in the name of Jesus and start telling people about Jesus, then all of a sudden, you're a problem that's gotta be dealt with. So can I just point this out? They won't say his name. Hey, at Lake Point, 
We love the name of Jesus. We love the name of Jesus. We worship Jesus. We teach about Jesus. We say the name of Jesus. We sing the name of Jesus. In fact, I I just want us right now at all of our campuses, because the name of Jesus is actually like a war declaration on spiritual forces of darkness, let's just practice it. On a count of three, we're going to shout the name of Jesus. One, two, three, Jesus. That's it, man. We're we're declaring war. So they're, they're, they're doing this thing. They're going, man, that we strictly charged you not to say that name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. That's what religious people do. They absolutely refuse to be seen as sinners in need of grace. And then skip down to verse 40. I'm gonna skip skip to the end here. So they do this whole little mock trial thing and then then here's what happens at the very end. And when they had called in the apostles, they, you say it, what do they do? They, They beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go, go. They beat them. Every Christian within the hearing of my voice needs to get this deep in your soul. If you are blessed by God, you will sometimes be beaten by men. There is no other way. There is no other way. Um, I talk about it all the time. One of the three greatest sermons I've ever heard was in 2008, I think. It was at a church leadership conference. There was a room of six to 800 people. It was all pastors. And it was like a super hypey, like, dude, let's, let's learn how to grow churches and, and you know, let, 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 you know all, the, all this kind of stuff. And, and this guy walked out, and it, like for the next 40 minutes, it was as if you were in the presence of John the Baptist. That's what it felt like. And he walked out, I'll never forget it, he walked out with a big smile on his face. And I don't, I don't want you to cheer or anything, I'm just going to describe what happened in the room. He walked out to all these cheering people that have been, you know, throwing beach balls and having fun. And he looked out of the crowd with a smile on his face and he said, do you want to be greatly used by God? And the whole room went, yeah. Everybody cheered. And then he grabbed his Bible and with a little more like zealousness, he said, I said, do you want to be greatly used by God? And the people kind of took a cue and they're a little louder, yeah, yeah. And then one more time. Do you, shouting, want to be used greatly by God? And the place went, now, yeah, 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 yeah. Just went absolutely nuts, standing ovation. And then he looked out at everybody and he said, then God must wound you deeply. And the room responded exactly like every room right now. You could hear a pin drop in the room. And then he said this. Because anyone God uses greatly gets wounded deeply. There is no way to read the Bible, the Gospels, or the book of Acts without understanding that blessing from God and beating from the world always go together. Can I point this out? You will see this pattern for the rest of the book of Acts while we're in it together. Here's the pattern of the book of Acts. Revival, riot. Revival, riot. Revival, riot. Revival, riot. Riot for the entire book. I heard so, Let me give you a little theology behind this because you need to understand what's happening to you, to the church in the world. You need to understand this. I heard somebody say it like this. Whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. So here, here's how it works. Whatever God, whatever God inaugurates, Satan opposes. Whatever God builds, Satan starts to break. And here's what that means. For every action of the spirit, there is always a reaction from unholy spirits the Bible calls demons. So whenever ministry happens, the mob starts to come. For every convert, there comes a critic. You start doing bold ministry, you will always be met by an emboldened mob. That will always happen. Happen. Now, sometimes, you must understand this. Some of you right now are experiencing this. You're not thinking about it biblically, and so you're getting confused, and you're experiencing false guilt, false condemnation, false shame that's from, from the devil, the accuser of the brethren. So you need to understand this. Sometimes as a Christian, you will suffer not because you did something wrong, but because you did something right. Sometimes you will be hated, not because you said something hateful, but because you said something loving to someone who is full of hate. We as Christians, we must never be surprised by this. Do you know why we should never be surprised? Because there's literally a Bible verse that says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, watch this, as though something strange were happening. So when it happens, don't go, oh, this is weird. 
I, I thought everyone was always going to applaud me. I thought everybody would love me as I started following you. Guys, we worship a guy who got crucified by the world. We worship a guy who got crucified. So don't think something weird's happening to you. Instead, do this. Instead, what? You say it. Instead, rejoice. Oh, this is amazing. Something awesome's happening. Why are people hating me? I don't know, but it's really awesome. That's what it says. In as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, what are you? You're, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You, you, you. Listen, that's it. You cannot, you cannot simultaneously experience the applause of the world and the anointing of God. Those two things do not, friendship with the world, the Bible says, is enmity towards God. Enmity towards God is what it says. So you must understand this. In fact, I just, again, what I'm doing right now in this part of the sermon is I'm saying the same thing over and over in different ways to twist a screw down into your soul. So I just want to, for our Bible nerds, do you remember 2 Timothy chapter 2? The Apostle Paul, an older father in the faith, looks at his son in the faith, Timothy, a young Christian who we know struggled with fear, timidity, a desire to be pleased by people. We know Timothy struggled with that. He had a spirit of fear that Paul was like, bro, we got to get that out of you. And he told this young Christian that he knew God can use that young man powerfully. He said, I need you to get three things in your head. You need to, be a, you need to become, like a, as you mature, you need to mature at, like a farmer, like an athlete, and like a soldier. First, Second Timothy 2. Farmer, athlete, soldier. Farmer. Farmers know how to wait. Farmers know not every season is harvest season. So do you have the ability, watch this, do you have the ability to wait upon the Lord? Or are you the type of guy who like, if you don't get immediate results, you're out. You need to mature. You need to be like a farmer. You need to keep plotting. You need to keep following Jesus. You need to keep staying in your Bible. You need to wake, wake up every day and pray. And then you need to leave your day like you act like it and then wait for the fruit to come. You need to mature. You need to be like a farmer. Then he goes, number two, you need to mature. You need to be like an athlete. Athletes are disciplined. Athletes understand that when you're born, you look like your parents, but when you die, you look like your habits. So he goes, hey man, can you spend the rest of your life, not, not just having a season where you stay with the Lord. How about day after day after day after day? Can you stay disciplined for the Lord? Can you do it when you don't feel like it? You need to grow as an athlete, but then watch this. Then he says, you need to mature and you need to become like a soldier. So watch this. Farmers, the question is, can you wait? Athletes, the question is, can you stay disciplined? Soldiers, can you take a punch? Can you take a punch? That's what a soldier has to be able to do. Hey, hey listen, Lake Point family, we need more Christians who can take a punch and then sing a hymn. We need more Christians who can take a punch and then sing a hymn. Like you're, you're just, you're gonna see this in the passage. Now, I, I, want, I wanna give it really quick, I wanna give, because sometimes, listen, you suffer because you were a knucklehead and you did something dumb. I've done that a million times, happens all the time. Sometimes that's why. And some people, they think they're suffering for righteousness sake when actually they're just rude. So like for, I just need to say this. For some people, hey man, your issue isn't that you're too righteous. Like, bro, you took a, you took a personality test and your Myers-Briggs came back J-E-R-K. It's like, bro, that's not, that's, that's your issue. So it's like, I'm not saying be jerks for Jesus. We're not gonna go out and be jerks for Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. But you do need to know this. If you live for Jesus, you will sometimes be called a jerk. And when the moment comes when you have to take a punch, can you stand up and act like a man, stand up and act like a woman of God, take the punch and then rejoice and then sing the hymn. Now, what we gotta do is we have to, let me land the plane, we have to respond to beatings with boldness. Can we be the kind of Christians who respond to beatings with boldness? Check this out. Here's how the passage ends. I said this earlier, then they, what do they do? They, they beat them, they beat them. Now, heads up. So the Jewish flogging was different than the Roman flogging, and this matters here in a second, so just track with me. The Jewish flogging was not as severe as the Roman flogging. A Roman flogging you could die from. It was cat of nine tails, they're raking the flesh off the, the back, all this stuff. A Jewish flogging, the Talmud says, what they would do is it was 40 lashes minus one. And that they literally did that because they assumed that 40 lashes could kill a guy, and they were like, man, maybe the dude with a little workout clicker might miss one, and we don't, we don't want to accidentally kill somebody, so we're going to, you know, let's, let's, let's roll it back. 
And the Talmud says this, when somebody was flogged according to the Jewish custom, they would tie their hands to a stake. They would then uh, take two long leather strips that were about four, four feet long, and then one third of the flogging would happen on the front of a man, and two thirds of the flogging would happen on their back. So these dudes would have been altered by this flogging. So they beat them. And then they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. Now, watch this. Let me me point this out now. If you had just had this happen, and you were just beaten, um, what would you have been thinking? I I think a lot of people would have been like, man, you know, you would have been Peter. You'd have been like, man, John, I'm feeling called to plant a church in Greece. (laughs) I, I, I feel called to Cyprus. Let's, let's go to the beach. I'm just feeling a move of the Spirit in a different direction. That's what most people would have done. What do these guys do? Check this out. Then they left the presence of the council. What do they do? Rejoicing. They took a punch and then they sang a hymn. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And then they walk right back in to the exact place where they were arrested and then beaten, and every single day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus was the Christ. They did not cease. Hey, Lake Point Church, we will not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. We will not cease. Now, dude, you got to get this. You got to get this, man. So I I need you to see what happened because this is the whole thing of the book of Acts. Now, remember, when Jesus is crucified and put on trial, the first place they take him is to the high priest. Then they put him on trial in front of what was called the Sanhedrin. And he's right there in Jerusalem, right next to the temple. Now, think about this. A lot of people miss this. Here's Peter. Peter is drug in front of the high priest. This is only, it's like 50 to 70 days after the crucifixion of Jesus. He's in front of the same high priest. Verse 34 references, quote, the council. That's the Sanhedrin. Peter's in front of the same Sanhedrin that gave Jesus the capital punishment uh, sentence. And then he's right there. He's in the exact same place in Jerusalem. Peter is talking to the same people that crucified Jesus. Now, here's why this is amazing. Here's why this is amazing. Just 50 days earlier, Peter is hiding from teenage girls. Just 50 days earlier, after the resurrection of Jesus, Peter and the apostles are locking themselves in rooms, quote, for fear of the Jews. But now... Peter is talking to the same people that crucified Jesus. He's walking out of beatings looking like an undercooked flank steak on his chest. And he's sharing Jesus with anybody who will listen. Let me ask this question. What changed? What changed? He was filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. Acts 1.8, we saw it at the very beginning. He says, but you will receive what? You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, listen, I, listen, all of my charismatic friends, I love you so much. I love you so much. But a lot of people, they're like, oh, hey, I've been filled with the Spirit because I got a prayer language. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said the sign of being filled with the Spirit, not a prayer language, it's power. Power for what? Power for witness. Power to be able to share Jesus with anybody, anywhere, without fear. Blessings beating boldness Lake Point Church can we take a punch can we sing a hymn can we walk right back out and listen understand Jesus took a beating for us we can take a few for him we can take a few for him now watch this man when we do that I read it to you earlier when we do that the Bible says a spirit of glory and of joy will rest on you you take some beatings for Jesus, you're gonna start to notice some things start to happen in your soul. And there's an anointing that rests on it. I wanna read you this. So we just had a mission team from Lake Point 
get back from, I'm not allowed to say the name of the country, get back from a communist country in East Asia. That's what I'm allowed to say. Um, this is a church that we financially support to make sure the work of God is spreading in a nation where Christ is not greatly known. And in this communist East Asian country, um, there are some churches that are government sanctioned churches, but in order to, to, to stay government sanctioned, there are certain aspects of Christianity they can't teach. So then there are bold Bible believing churches that are illegal and they have to stay house churches. We fund one of these house church networks at Lake Point. One of these uh, teams just got back and I wanna read you this testimony that they handed me when they got back. I'm gonna read it as it is in front of me. There is a communist government official who has always wanted to shut our church partners down. For years, her supervisor has been, had been the only thing preventing her from interfering and shutting down our house church. However, much to the house church's dismay, her supervisor recently retired and she, the communist leader who has always wanted to shut down their illegal church, has risen to a higher level of authority and she immediately began making attempts to shut them down. On Good Friday, the communist leader showed up at the church offices and asked to speak only with the pastor. <clears throat> she and the officials brought with her she and the officials she brought with her sternly told him that he was no longer allowed to meet and ordered him to shut the church down. Now, before I read the next sentence, what he replied, I didn't get to read it to you earlier, but when the demonic religious leaders told Peter and the apostles, stop talking about Jesus, their response was, we must obey God rather than men. This is what this church leader said to a communist East Asian country official. The pastor calmly but boldly said, you don't have that authority. And she left very angry. Hey guys, how many of us understand there is an authority higher than the government because we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? How many of us understand that? Okay. Now, the church leaders prayed and despite the threat of legal action or imprisonment, decided to continue with services that night anyway, unsure of what might happen. Good Friday and Easter Sunday services happened without interference, although they kept waiting for the doors to burst open by the police. Then, miraculously, they received a letter from the government. Without any explanation, they were informed that this official was no longer in authority over them, and they would be under supervision of someone new. They said this was their Easter resurrection story. They were told that their church was dead on a Friday, but it came back to life on a Sunday. Come on, man. Come on, man. We take some beatings for Jesus. We experience blessing and boldness. And listen, do you know what this, you know what this church did in this communist East Asian country? I'm gonna quote the passage we just read. From house to house, they did not cease preaching and teaching that Jesus was the Christ. Come on, Lake Point Church. Let's be those people, man. Come on. I want to pray this into our spirits. And so, man, would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? And so, Heavenly Father, I am asking that a spirit of glory and of joy falls on the people of Lake Point. Father, would you make us people with love in our hearts, fire in our eyes, steel in our spines, and we are ready to rejoice and count it an honor to suffer dishonor along with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who laid his life down for us so that we might live with him forever. And so Father, we love you. Jesus, we praise you. We love your name. Jesus, we sing your name. We pray to your name. Jesus, we love your name. We preach your name. We live in your name. Jesus, we worship you as the crucified and risen King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen.